This is True News, uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Walls. G20 world leaders met in Shanghai, China in late February to discuss the global financial system. On the surface, it appears that not much happened in that meeting. In the weeks since the meeting, a growing number of financial analysts have concluded that a secret deal was sealed that may seriously damage the U.S. dollar. For example, London's Financial Times published this headline on March 21st. Currency market buzzes over tacit G20 deal. The London publication said, Did last month's G20 meeting in Shanghai come up with a secret currency accord between the world's big central banks? That's the chatter in Forex market markets after a series of policy meetings not short on surprises. Of course, I should note the IMF and the Chinese have denied that a secret deal was made at last month's G20 summit. James Rickards, author of The Death of Money, is convinced, however, a secret deal was made in Shanghai. He is the editor of the Strategic Intelligence Financial Newsletter and director of the James Rickards Project. Additionally, he is a lawyer, economist, and senior managing director at Tangent Capital Partners. His website is jamesrickardsproject.com, and his newest book will be released next Tuesday, April 5th. The title is The New Case for Gold. James, uh, glad to have you back to True News. Uh, the, the Chinese and the IMF are both denying that a deal was made. What, what happened in Shanghai? Well, thank you, Rick. Great to be with you. Uh, sure, what's the point of having a, uh, a secret meeting if you're not going to deny it later? That would unveil the secret. So, um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, maybe for the listeners, kind of give the cast of characters here. So you have something called the G20. G just means group, you know, group of 20. So it's a group of 20 countries that includes the largest economies in the world plus some of the emerging markets. So these are, uh, these are the countries that run the international monetary system. They operate through the IMF, that's the International Monetary Fund, that's been around since 1944, also another very powerful organization. The International Monetary Fund, think of it as the central bank of the world, so you know, the Federal Reserve is the U.S. central bank, and the European central bank is the, obviously the central bank of Europe. The IMF is sort of central bank of the world, so you've got the G20 countries operating through the IMF, operating a world central bank. By the way, none of this is, you know, deep, dark conspiracy, uh, not trying to conjure up any boogeyman. And this is all out in plain sight. We know who the players are, you know, Christine Lagarde at the IMF, Mario Draghi at the European Central Bank, Janet Yellen at the Fed, certain profet- we know who all these players are. So they get together several times each year. Um, the G20 has their own meetings. Then the IMF has meetings. They have another one coming up in a few weeks, by the way. We've got to keep an eye on that, April 13th in Washington, D.C. But the G20 are there, and so they meet on the sidelines of the IMF. So you have direct G20 meetings, and then you have these sort of shadow G20 meetings on the sidelines of the IMF. So this is the group. We know who the individuals are that run the international monetary system. Uh, they absolutely talk, and they absolutely meet behind closed doors and, and cook up these plans. Now, how do we know that? You know, unless you're in the room, uh, when I wasn't in the room, how do we know that? Well, I've done uh, a lot of work and still do for the U.S. intelligence community, and we use methods uh, called causal inference, uh, inferential methods, uh, the scientific applied mathematics formula called Bayes' theorem that we can use to actually uh, uncover these facts. And uh, so one of the things you do is just look at their behavior. Like after they get out of the meeting, this meeting, by the way, took place February 26th, in Shanghai, China, so we know the exact location and the date. And then in, in about the, the 10 days or 15 days that followed, there were three central bank announcements, one from the Bank of Japan, one from the European Central Bank, and one from the Federal Reserve. Uh, European Central Bank was March 10th, uh, Bank of Japan was March 14th, Federal Reserve was March 15th. So sort of boom, 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 they came out right in a row. And it, the coordination was absolutely obvious. They were out to send a lifeline to China, help the Chinese currency depreciate without sinking the U.S. stock market. Because China's got to depreciate. Their economy's falling apart. Their growth is declining. They've got to cheapen their currency. This is what the currency wars are all about. This is in my, my first book, Currency Wars. The problem is, last August, 
they did a big devaluation of the currency, 3% in one day. We all remember what happened. The U.S. stock market practically collapsed. I mean, just listeners could say, where were you on August 31st, 2015? Well, you might have been on vacation, you might have been taking your kids to college or whatever, but we were staring into the abyss. The people were in a panic mode. The U.S. stock market was collapsing. That was a reaction to this Chinese surprise, you know, sort of sneak attack devaluation. So come forward, you know, six months, now we're in March. China still needs to devalue, but the world financial system is so unstable and uh, so ready to collapse that they say, well, China, you can't devalue explicitly because you'll start another stock market meltdown. So let's cook up a way to do it through the back door. So what they said is the U.S. would actually ease, meaning surprise the markets by being a little bit easier on monetary policy. So that way China can maintain the peg to the U.S. dollar. But Europe and Japan would tighten, do something that would surprise the markets the other way and make their currencies a little bit stronger. Now, China has big trading relationships with Europe and Japan. So one way to help China is to cheapen the Chinese currency against the dollar. But the other way to do it is to make the euro and the the Japanese yen a little bit stronger. And that's what they did. So Kuroda, who's the head of the Bank of Japan, they thought he would be doing a lot more QE, and he didn't. He did some, but not as much as they thought. Draghi, they thought would do some, but he said, okay, I'm going to do some, but then that's it. I'm done. I'm not doing any more. And that was a shock. And then Janet Yellen, a lot of people thought the Federal Reserve would raise rates, and they didn't, and they issued a kind of dovish statement. So the combination, this is like when you're shooting pool. You know, it's one thing when you have a shot lined up and you sink the ball. But there's something called a three-cushion bank shot where, you know, you, you hit the cushion, you hit a ball, you hit another ball, it hits the ball, and the ball goes in the hole. That's the kind of crazy convoluted thing that they cooked up here. So what actually happened is what I described. The euro and the Japanese yen got stronger. That gave the Chinese currency a break. But nobody noticed because the Chinese-U.S. exchange rate didn't change because the Fed got easier also. But the point, Rick, really is and I can describe this in technical terms. In fact, I just did. But this is so difficult for everyday Americans to understand. They don't understand, and why should they, right? People are not all international monetary experts. They've got you know lives to lead, and they've got day jobs. This is so convoluted. Who do these PhDs think they are manipulating all these markets, and how long will it be before the whole thing just falls apart? James, I'm looking at some news articles that have come out uh, today and, and one yesterday, uh, Wall Street Journal, just two hours ago. U.S. dollar on track for worst quarterly performance since 2010. And then Money Magazine headline is, Why the U.S. dollar is suddenly worth less this week? And it says the U.S. dollar hit its lowest level against the euro in nearly seven weeks on Wednesday following dovish comments from Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen that pushed out expectations for the central bank's next interest rate hike. Are those two articles evidence of what you're talking about? Absolutely. They, they talk about, notice they don't mention China, right? They talk about a weaker dollar and a stronger euro. Uh, but China is pegged to the dollar. The Chinese currency is pegged to the dollar. So if you have a weaker dollar, guess what? You get a weaker Chinese currency. So we're actually weakening our currency. It might help the U.S. a little bit, but what we're really doing is helping China to weaken their currency without anybody noticing. So meanwhile, who are the, this is what the currency wars are all about. So who are the losers in this? Well, the losers are Europe and Japan, and the article you mentioned, Rick, talks about Europe, but the same thing's happening with the Japanese yen. But it's exactly what I just described. The euro and the yen get stronger. The dollar and the Chinese yuan stay the same. Everyone thinks the yuan has not devalued, but it actually did against the euro and the yen. So China gets the relief, but nobody notices, and the U.S. stock market doesn't collapse. So it's just a massive manipulation. I'm expert in all this. I spent my career studying this, so I understand it pretty clearly. But it is, uh, it's not easy to, uh, to follow all these machinations. But it's one of the things I talk about in my book, The New Case for Gold. Uh, you know, do you want to be in the middle of these currency wars? Do you want to be caught up in all these currency games? Or at least have some of your assets, not all of them, but I recommend 10% in physical gold. And then when this whole, uh, when this whole shell game falls apart, you'll, your wealth will be preserved in the form of gold. If they did make a deal in Shanghai to devalue the dollar, how big of a drop are you anticipating? Well, you know, let's just look at the last time the dollar was, was really weak. Um, in August 2011, August 2011 was the all-time low for the dollar. That was the weakest dollar on this index that the Federal Reserve uses. It wasn't just against one currency. You, you mentioned 
uh, the dollar versus the euro, and that's right. But there's an index that the Federal Reserve keeps against all currencies, all trading partners. The all-time low was August 2011. Guess what? That was also the all-time high for gold. That was the month that gold hit $1,900 an ounce. Today it's around uh, – Twelve hundred fifty dollars an ounce, but August two thousand eleven, it was nineteen hundred dollars an ounce, and the dollar is at an all-time low. Now, between August two thousand eleven and the end of two thousand fifteen, the dollar got stronger and stronger and stronger, not quite to an all-time high, that was nineteen eighty-five, but to a ten-year high. So, a very strong dollar, but it was killing the U.S. economy. It was killing exports. It was killing corporate earnings. It was having very, uh, very strong negative impacts on the U.S. economy. So the Fed got to a point where they said, okay, we've done all we can. You know, so, uh, this, again, this is what the currency wars are all about. So 2013 was the weak yen. That's when Prime Minister Abe unleashed Abenomics, and they said we're going to weaken the yen and try to give ourselves a lift. 2014 and 2015, that was the weak euro. In January 2015, the euro was all the way down to a dollar five. Today it's back up to around a dollar fourteen. That's a you know significant. That's a ten percent appreciation. So, so Europe got you know, Japan got the weak yen. Euro got the weak euro. But now the U.S. is saying, hey guys, it's our turn. It's our turn to trash our currency. You got your break. Now we're taking a break. The way I describe this uh, for listeners, Rick, is imagine you have five soldiers. They're fighting. It's a hundred degrees. It's a hot day. Uh, they're all thirsty. They're all tired, and they've got one canteen. What do you do? Well, everybody wants to drink the whole canteen, but you don't. You take a sip and pass it to the next guy. He takes a sip, passes a sip to the next guy, and so forth. That's what the currency wars are all about. Not every currency can devalue all at the same time. It's a mathematical impossibility. So you have to take turns with the cheap currency. But now it looks like the U.S. is saying it's our turn for cheap currency. But what happened the last time the dollar got weak? Gold skyrocketed. That's when gold went to $1,900 an ounce. I'm not saying it's going to go to $1,900 an ounce you know, next month or next week. But a weak dollar is a very good environment for a higher price for gold. What does it mean for the uh, average middle-class American? Well, one of the things you're going to see is inflation because, um, you know, remember, the U.S. is a net importer. We import more than we export. So when you have a cheaper dollar, that means it takes more dollars to get – you know, Chinese textiles, uh, you know, Japanese electronics, French wine, German cars, you know, European vacations, machine, whatever we import from abroad is going to cost more in dollars because the dollar is weaker. So that means inflation is coming into the United States. By the way, that's exactly what the Fed wants. And the Fed said so. It's no secret. They want more inflation because how are we going to get off under this $19 trillion of debt? You can't, you know, you could default, but we're not going to. The way the, way the U.S. defaults, we actually pay you the money, but we pay it in cheaper dollars, so it's not worth as much. So it's like saying to China, hey, China, you know, here's the trillion dollars we owe you, but good luck buying a loaf of bread because we inflated the currency away. So, so a cheaper dollar on foreign exchange markets means higher import prices, means more inflation. And again, that's another reason why gold goes up, because gold does very well in inflation. Right now, in September 2015, the IMF voted to admit the Chinese yuan to its basket of currencies effective September 2016. Is this current move to devalue the U.S. dollar connected to that decision? It's definitely all connected. And, and again, I think for the listeners, we'll just take a second and explain what the, what the SDR is. So the International Monetary Fund, I described it as the central bank of the world. So our central bank, the Fed, prints dollars. The European Central Bank, the ECB, prints euros. The IMF has a printing press also. They print a kind of world money. They call it the Special Drawing Right, uh, SDR for short. Uh, the SDR is a geeky technical name. That's because they don't want you to understand what it is. But I call it world money because it is world money. So the IMF prints this world money. Now, there are currently four currencies that are used to determine the value of an SDR. And by the way, a lot of people think that this basket of, I mentioned four currencies, soon to be five, a lot of people think this basket backs up the SDR, stands behind it. That's not true. There's nothing behind the SDR. It's just like the U.S. dollar. There's nothing standing behind it. But the basket is used to calculate the value of an SDR. So if you say, what's an SDR worth in dollars? The answer today is about a dollar forty-five. but it fluctuates. It's been as low as a dollar thirty-five, as high as a dollar fifty-five. You use these currencies to calculate the value of the SDR, 
uh, which the IMF prints and hands out to its members. Right now, there are four currencies in it. There's the U.S. dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, and pound sterling. And the announcement you described, Rick, is that they've now announced they're going to add a fifth currency, the Chinese yuan, to this basket. Now, it's not effective yet. It won't be effective until the end of September 2016, but it has already been announced. This is a big prestige boost for China. Why should anyone care? Because this world money will replace the dollar as the global reserve currency in stages. Now, there's sort of a 10-year plan to do this, but it could happen much faster than that. If there's a financial panic, and I do expect one, you can see that coming. When there's a financial panic, remember the last panic in 2008, what happened? The Federal Reserve printed $4 trillion to bail out the banks. The Federal Reserve did $10 trillion of swap lines with the Europeans and others to bail out their banks, basically swapping them dollars for the local currency. But the problem is they haven't reversed that policy. That that $4 trillion of printed money is still on the books. And so when the next crisis comes, what are they going to do? Print $4 trillion more? Take it to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? At that point, I mean, legally they could, but they're going to break the confidence boundary. They're going to destroy confidence in the dollar. So the world's going to have a problem. We're going to have a financial panic. We're going to need liquidity. But the Fed and the other central banks are not going to be able to provide it because they're tapped out. So where's that liquidity going to come from? It's going to come from the IMF in the form of these SDRs, printing trillions of them, handing them out. That will solve the liquidity problem, at least in the short run, but it's going to be massively inflationary. And this will be the end of the dollar as the global reserve currency because from then on, it's going to be the SDR. And that's what China wanted. China was saying to the IMF, hey, we want to be in the club. We want more voting power. By the way, as an aside, they got more voting power. In December 2015, Paul Ryan pushed through a budget deal. Buried inside that budget deal was a, was a provision authorizing the IMF to give China more voting power. I, I doubt most uh, Americans, or certain media, uh, everyday citizens were aware of that, but buried inside that bill, there was a provision that gave the IMF, IMF the ability to give China more voting power. So China got more votes. They got their currency included in the SDR, so they're now in the club, and that was quid pro quo because China's permission, approval, is going to be needed to issue all these SDRs. So in the next crisis, which is coming, they'll need liquidity. It'll come from the IMF in the form of the SDRs. China will be in the club. They will agree to it, and that will be the end of the dollar as a global reserve currency. The SDR will take over from there. The impact for everyday investors, again, inflation. So... So get your goal now. I mean, don't wait for this to happen because you're not going to be able to get the goal when it happens. How far are we into this 10-year plan? Well, uh, this 10-year plan I described was issued in 2010, so we're six years into it. I mean, this is uh, pretty far along. It happens in stages. The point I was making is the 10-year plan would be um, uh, if nothing bad happens, but I don't think we'll make it that far. I think we'll have a crisis before we get to the end of the plan, and they'll have to accelerate the plan. And by the way, again, uh, Rick, these are not secret plans. This paper that I talked about, it's on the IMF website. You can go find it. Now, the problem is you have to be an expert. Uh, I I call the IMF, I say that they're transparently non-transparent. What I mean by that is they do put stuff on the website. You can read the paper. It's there. It's not secret. But good luck reading it. I mean, it's technical jargon. I happen to be trained in and I have a graduate degree in international economics, so I understand this stuff. And, you know, sometimes I feel like an anthropologist going into the jungle, speaking to the natives, and then kind of coming back and telling everyday Americans what they're saying. I've, I've got the specialized language of the international monetary system, and I try to put it in plain English for, for listeners so, so every, everybody can understand what's going on. But um, the plan is there. It's being implemented in stages. My estimate is that there'll be a crisis before we get there, and they'll have to accelerate the plans. So this could happen sooner than people think. Yeah, I've said for years on this radio program that the globalists are doing everything out in the open. They tell us what they're doing. It's just that most people aren't reading it or listening to it or understanding it. But it's out there. They're telling us uh, where they're taking the world. They want a one-world type of system. They, you know, they want a, a, a system that a very small group of people are, are controlling uh, the resources of the world. Whether they obtain it, I don't know. But that's where they want to take this uh, this planet. Jim, what about negative interest rates? Are we going to see more nations dip into negative interest rate territory? Sure, it's already happening. Uh, so right now today, uh, we have negative interest rates in Europe, 
Uh, all the members of the Eurozone, so that's 19 countries, have negative interest rates. Sweden, Switzerland, Japan, and the U.S. is talking about it. We don't have it yet in the U.S., but Janet Yellen, chairman of the Federal Reserve, has spoken about it publicly as recently as two days ago in her speech to the Economic Club of New York. So this is on the table. Um, now, so what's the negative interest rate? So they basically, instead of paying you interest, they take money away. So you put $100,000 in the bank with a 1% negative rate. You come back a year later, you have $99,000. They took $1,000 out of your account, took your money. That's what a negative interest rate is. Now, people say, well, you know, I'll, fine, I'll just go get cash. I'll get my cash out of the bank, stick it in a coffee can, bury it in my backyard, put it under my mattress, whatever, and I'll still have my $100,000 a year from now. Uh, and they can't get me with a negative interest rate. You know, by the way, talk to, uh, talk to your parents and grandparents about the Great Depression. They'll tell you stories about people doing exactly that, taking the cash out of the banks because they didn't trust the banks. So, uh, but there's a problem with that. Uh, it's called the war on cash. And a lot of people are aware of it. Basically, governments are trying to eliminate cash. See, if you're going to slaughter a bunch of pigs and cows, you got to herd them up and get them in a pen. You don't go run around chasing the cows on the open range. You herd them into a pen, and then you slaughter them. So that's what's going on with money. People are being herded into a digital pen uh, at the big banks. All the money is being forced into digital form in the big banks, and then they're going to slaughter you with these negative interest rates. Now, people say, oh, I'll just go get my cash. Really? Try doing it. Go down to your bank tomorrow, ask for $5,000 in cash. You will be treated like a criminal, a drug dealer, a terrorist, or a tax evader. It's perfectly legal, by the way. There's nothing illegal about it. But some banks will say, come back in two days, you know, sort of cash by appointment. They'll make you sign a lot of documents. If you do $10,000 or more, they'll file a what's called a currency transaction report uh, with the United States government. Even for amounts less than $10,000, they'll probably file what's called an SAR, suspicious activity report, because, you know, if you never took $5,000 out before and suddenly you go down and take out $5,000, that looks suspicious. And, again, even though you're a perfectly innocent civilian, you're, you're doing something totally legal, it's your money, you will be treated with suspicion by the bank because you never did it before, and they'll file this report with the government. Now you're in the crosshairs. And the tellers are trained to do this. There's no upside for them by cutting you a break. They're told, hey, if you don't file the reports, you're fired. That's how kind of terrorized the whole financial system is. So my point is, technically, can you get cash? Yeah, it's legal, but try doing it. Like I said, you'll be treated like a criminal. So uh, people ask me about the war on cash. I say, look, the war on cash is over. The government won. So, so now you're forced to keep your money in the bank. It's a digital asset. By the way, if the government doesn't get you a negative interest rates, Vladimir Putin will, because he's got a 6,000-member cyber brigade working day and night to hack, disrupt, destroy, and delete all these digital assets, which they can do. Uh, just to give you an example of that, just last week, the country of Bangladesh, they had a $100 million bank deposit that disappeared. Now, guess who, guess who they had the, bank with, uh, the deposit with? By the way, Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world. That was the New York Federal Reserve. New York Federal Reserve. It wasn't like some off-the-run bank in Bangladesh. It was the New York Federal Reserve, arguably the safest, strongest bank in the world, and $100 million disappeared. And it went, so, it went into uh, casinos in the Philippines. Oh, yeah, and good luck finding it. And, and it could go a lot of places. It could also just be erased, by the way. They don't, you know, the Russian intelligence and military, they're not necessarily out to steal your money. They're out to make your money go away, make it disappear. But, James, also, I mean, you could have this type of massive theft of digital money and blame it on anybody. You could blame it on the Martians. We're not going to know who's stealing. It could be the Federal Reserve stealing from us. That's exactly right. And I, that's why I recommend physical gold, not paper gold, not ETF gold, not gold futures, not, uh, you know, gold contracts, but physical gold, partly because it's non-digital. And, you know, and, and Rick, a lot of people ask me, my book is called The New Case for Gold. And they say, hey, Jim, what's new about it? And these gold arguments have been going on for decades or probably centuries. What's new about The New Case for Gold? Well, one of the things that's new is what we're talking about, Rick, which is digital cyber financial warfare, the ability to wipe out digital assets. Gold, we weren't talking about that in the 80s and the 90s. I mean, you didn't have the Internet. You didn't have these cyber crimes and cyber financial warfare. But gold is physical. It's not digital. You can't erase it. You can't hack it. You can't delete it. You can't steal it online. So it's another way to preserve wealth. Uh, and, again, I talk about this a lot in, in my book, The New Case for Gold. Are they going to succeed in totally eliminating cash? 
Uh, eventually, yes. I mean, first of all, Sweden is already talking about it. They're, they're, um, and, and, and by the way, you know, again, these things, the power elite works, work in stages, small stages. They know that if they do this stuff overnight, there'll be a popular outcry. Uh, so they do it in baby steps so nobody notices, and you kind of get used to it, you know. By the way, let's just go back 100 years. So let's go back to uh, a little over 100 years, say 1910. In 1910, people still had gold and silver coins in their pockets. Not all their money, but gold and silver coins were not unusual. It was legal tender. You could pay for something with a with a gold twenty dollar, uh, you know, one ounce coin. It was twenty dollars. Today it's one thousand two hundred fifty dollars. But back then it was uh, it was a twenty dollar coin. As recently as 1964, when I was a kid and had a newspaper route, uh, dimes and quarters were silver. Pure silver. I had I had silver coins in my pocket as a kid in 1964. It wasn't that long ago. So the point is, but in World War One, what they did, they melted down all the gold coins, took them out of circulation, put them into 400 ounce bars. So they said you can still own gold, but you got to have one of these 400 ounce bars. Well, first of all, that was too much for most people to afford. And even if you could afford it, you weren't going to walk around. That's a 35 pound bar. You're not going to walk around with a 35 pound bar of gold in your pocket. So you're like, okay, I got the gold, but it's but it's in the bank vault. So step one was take it out of circulation, put it in the bank vaults. Step two, the Federal Reserve turned to all the central banks, or sorry, all the commercial banks, and said, give us your gold. You have to deposit your gold to buy your stock in the Federal Reserve. So they did. So now all the gold's at the Federal Reserve. Step three, in the Roosevelt administration, they confiscated the gold from the Federal Reserve and gave it to the Treasury, which put it in Fort Knox. So see how this happens in steps? First, the gold coins go out of circulation. Then it goes to the commercial banks. Then it's concentrated in the Federal Reserve. And then the Treasury takes all of it and sticks it in Fort Knox. So now the Treasury's got the gold in everyday America. You, you, you can buy gold today, but mm-hmm. you know, from 1933 to 1975, it was illegal for Americans to own gold. It was a crime. It was like owning drugs. It was contraband. Uh, and that changed during the Ford administration. What I tell uh, people, Rick, is... Don't wait for the world to go on a gold standard. You can go on a personal gold standard because you are free to buy some gold, and it has the advantages uh, I talked about. You know, it's not digital. You can't hack it. Um, and if you own gold, you know, I don't want to be in the business of giving tax advice, but if you own gold and it goes up and up and up, you don't pay any tax on that. Now, if you sell it, yes, you do. If you sell the gold, you got to declare the gain and pay the tax. But if you hold on to it, it can go to the moon, and you don't have to pay any tax on that. So it's a non-cyber asset tax-deferred, preserves wealth, um, and again, for 10% of your portfolio, you'll be very well served. Are the international banksters uh, prepared for an old-fashioned revolt? It's been a long time since there have been mobs in the streets with pitchforks and torches. Well, you know, occasionally you do see this in China. There are a lot of riots in China, very underreported, but uh, no, I do foresee what I call money riots, uh, and, and this gets to the next financial crisis. Money riots. Yeah, I, I, I'm talk right. about that. I want to hear more about that. Sure. So, so look at this tempo. So, let's go back to 1998. Long-term capital management, hedge fund collapse. The the world was hours away, hours away from every stock and bond market in the world being shut. And I know because I was there. I was the general counsel of long-term capital management. I personally negotiated that bailout. I was on the phone with the treasury, or in person with the treasury, the Fed, the heads of the 14 big Wall Street banks. So I did that deal. And I can tell you, and now Greenspan testified the same thing, that we were just hours away from the entire financial system shutting down. Now, we got the deal done. We kind of phoned the runways. The plane didn't blow up. But, but people don't know how dangerous that was. So, that, so then come 10 years forward, in 2008, we were just days away, hours or days away from the sequential collapse of every bank in America. And again, the Fed stepped in and bailed that out. So come forward 10 more years to 2018. So look at this tempo. In 1998... Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund to save the world. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street to save the world. In 2018, who's going to bail out the central banks? Because they're the ones in trouble now. They're the ones leveraged 100 to 1. They're the ones who used up all their dry power powder. Well, of course, the only balance sheet left in the world is the IMF. That's going to be the, the SDR rescue that, that we talked about. So that's sort of where, where the world is heading. But uh, the next time... They're not going to paper it over because they, they, like I say, they used up the dry power powder. What they're going to do, they're going to shut the money market funds. Last year, look this up, 
Last year, the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, changed the rules on money market funds and said they can suspend redemptions, just like a hedge fund. So people today, they've got money in money market funds. They think they have money. They say, well, I can call my broker, sell my shares, the money will be in my account tomorrow. Uh Uh-uh. The money market funds now have the ability in a financial crisis to say, sorry, you can't sell your shares. We are suspending redemptions. So you're not going to be able to get that money. They can reprogram the ATMs to allow you $300 a day for gas and groceries, no more. So it doesn't matter if you have $100,000 in the bank. You can only get $300 a day for gas and groceries. And they'll say, why do you need more than that? Um, They're going to close the New York Stock Exchange. When I say things like this, Rick, people say, oh, that would never happen. You know what? The New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months from July to November, uh, sorry, July to December 1914. Five months, the New York Stock Exchange was closed. This ha- New York Stock Exchange was closed in Hurricane Sandy. It was closed after 9-11. It happens all the time. So when people say these things will never happen, they're in denial. They, they have happened. They'll happen again. In 1933, the Frank, Franklin Roosevelt, by executive order, closed every bank in America. There was no legislation. Just by executive order, he shut every bank in America. They opened eight days later, but people didn't know that at the time. They didn't know how long the banks were going to be closed. So stock exchanges are shut down. Banks have been closed. Look at what happened in Cyprus. Look at what happened in Greece with reprogramming the ATMs. Uh, every, look at what happened in Bangladesh. Every one of the things I'm talking about, this is not science fiction. They're happening. They have happened. They will happen again. But when that happens, I would expect money rise. People are going to go burn down banks. Um, and, you know, there'll be this kind of vigilanteism, and then the response to that will be a neo-fascist response. It'll be, you know, either martial law or national guards. It's, it's um, you know, we had national guards in the streets of Washington, D.C. Uh, in, um, in 1968, 1970, 1971, so it'll happen again. Jim, what about oil? In, in recent weeks, uh, there's been uh, an attempt to bring about a rally in price of oil, but I'm not sure it can be sustained. Uh, you know, the, the the world is still awash in, in petroleum. What, what do you see for the remainder of this year and going into 2017 with oil? Well, it's a lot like gold. It sort of depends on what the Federal Reserve is doing with interest rates and inflation and deflation. Now, if you think money is manipulated, which it is, and markets are manipulated, which they are, boy, is the price of oil manipulated. Look, Saudi Arabia can make the price of oil whatever they want. They have the largest reserves in the world and the lowest cost of production. It costs them about $3 a barrel. So as, as low as $4 a barrel, I'm not saying oil is going to go to $4, but what I am saying is that oil could be 4 or $5 a barrel, and Saudi Arabia would still make a profit and still have the world's largest oil reserves. So if they want to shut the taps, the price will go up. If they want to open the taps, the price will go down. So they can set the price of oil pretty much anywhere they want. So where do where do they want the price of oil to be? They want it to be low enough to destroy the fracking industry. That's about $60 a barrel, but not too low because they, they don't want to run a budget deficit. They actually need the revenue to pay all these 50% of the people in Saudi Arabia work for the government. They've got a big payroll to, to meet, not to mention the princes and all, allowances and all that stuff. So, um, so And they have to finance uh, jihad around the world, too. Jihad and also uh, weapons purchases uh, to confront Iran. And uh, if Iran gets a nuke, they're going to buy uh, nuclear weapons from Pakistan. So, yeah, they've they got a big budget, a, lot, a long shopping list of weapons and, uh, and jihadists and other things going on. So for Saudi Arabia, they don't want it to be more than $60 a barrel, but they'd like it to be you know, at least kind of 40 50 The problem is it overshot, and Iran- Iranian oil came back online. Iraqi oil is coming back online. I'm not an oil expert, um, uh, Rick. I, I'm, again, I'm a monetary expert and a global macroeconomist, but of course I follow the oil market. But look, let's just look back to Janet Yellen. If she cheapens the dollar the dollar price of oil is going to go up. If she tightens and strengthens the dollar, the the dollar price of oil could very well go down. So once again, oil is oil, gold is gold. The dollar price of oil or gold really depends on the value of the dollar. And if we see the dollar going down, uh, which it looks like it's heading that way right now, then the price of oil will go up at least a little bit. But then Saudi Arabia will jump in and not let it go up too much. So, uh, so again, it's all manipulated. I see oil trading in a range. Probably the range is, you know, 30 at the low end, 60 at the high end. It'll fluctuate in that range, but it'll trend a little bit higher if the dollar cheapens. 
But if the Fed goes back to raising interest rates, which they might later this year, then it could very well go down. So I guess the I guess volatility is the watchword. But at the end of the day, an estimated 30 to 50 percent of the U.S. energy corporations are teetering on bankruptcy. Well, that's right, and they are going bankrupt. You know, they uh, this really hit them in late 2014, early 2015. Uh, but that doesn't mean you go bankrupt the next day. Because uh, what they started doing, they started pumping more. You know, even though it was non-economic, they said, "Well, it, it, they they stopped drilling new wells." Okay, so that the new wells dried up completely, and they laid off people and stopped buying pipe and running drills and equipment and all the stuff they needed to do new wells, because the new wells were not economic. But the existing wells were still there. Those are sunk costs. They already spent that money, so they just start pumping them like crazy, uh, and the result was that they uh, they actually was an oil glut. That drove the price down more. That gave them a little bit of cash flow to pay the principal and interest, but fracked wells actually have a shorter life than uh, conventional wells. So those wells are already drying up. Uh, they're running out of cash. The price of oil went even lower than they thought. Uh, they need six or seven dollars a barrel, as I mentioned, just to break even. So for all those reasons, those companies. And, and by the way, they were highly leveraged. Where, where did all this fracked oil come from? Where did all this equipment come from? All these, uh, you know, pipes and rigs and labor and all this stuff. Well, the answer is they borrowed the money. They borrowed trillions of dollars. So right now we're looking at the bankruptcy of these companies, trillions of dollars of defaults on the debt. Again, that's a further drag on the economy, losses for investors' portfolio. To me, it's just one more reason to uh, to have some gold in the mix. And again, I talked about that in my book, The New Case for Gold. All right, uh, final question. When I get my copy of The New Case for Gold, what am I going to learn? Well, you're going to learn a lot. Uh, chapter one has something that I've never seen. Uh, I researched it and discovered it and put it in the book, um, but I've never seen it anywhere before. I've never heard any analyst talk about it. I've never, never seen it discussed, described, or whatever. I think I've unlocked the key to why the U.S. Treasury cannot sell more gold. You know, in 1950 we had 20,000 tons of gold in the United States. In 1970 we had 9,000 tons of gold. We lost 11,000 tons of gold to our trading partners under Bretton Woods. By 1980, we were down to 8,000 tons of gold. We dumped another 1,000 tons of gold on the market in the late 70s to suppress the price. But since 1980, we've stayed right about at that 8,000 ton level. The U.S. stopped selling significant amounts of gold in 1980, right at the 8,000 ton level. That's how much we have today, 35 years later. Why is that? Well, the answer is that that money is needed to prop up the Federal Reserve. And nobody thinks we're on the gold standard. I have news for you. We are on a shadow gold standard that nobody talks about. That means the U.S. cannot sell gold, cannot suppress the price except through paper transactions. We got the English, we got the Brits to sell uh, most of their gold in 1999. We got the Swiss to sell thousands of tons of their gold in the early 2000s. Uh, poor Canada sold the last of its gold. They didn't have a lot, but they sold. They now have zero gold. The only major developed country to have zero gold. We got the IMF to sell 400 tons in 2010. So the U.S. is running around getting everyone else to sell their gold. Why doesn't the U.S. sell gold? Because that gold is needed to prop up the Fed. And I explain this in detail in Chapter 1 of the book. Yeah, it's really scary when I can say that I own more gold than the Central Bank of Canada. You do, and uh, so do I. (laughs) Amazing. All right, the book is The New Case for Gold, is available right now for pre-order. It's going to be released next Tuesday, April 5th. The author is James Rickards. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, Rick.